Hello everybody. This video is going to focus on the anatomy that you need to know for the nervous system practical test. When you are in e-learning under week four, you will notice that there's a short introduction to APR or anatomy and physiology revealed and the practice atlas on connect. If you scroll down to the nervous system anatomy, this first link here is a short video that I've made that walks you through how to set up APR to your specific anatomy list for this course. So when you go into Connect, you'll see Anatomy and Physiology revealed over here on the left. You'll also see a Practice Atlas. The Practice Atlas, when you click on it, will allow you to see cadaver images side by side with models. You should be able to identify the structures on your list from any of these types of images. You can select the different images you want by just using the drop down. Now the Atlas is not as customizable as APR. So if you go into APR, which is the anatomy and physiology revealed, you will have the opportunity to choose my course content and I have walked you through in the video how to set this up to this specific course. Once you have done that, then choose Nervous System. You can go through individual structures or you can take the quiz. And when you do that, the quiz will be specific to anatomy objectives on your list. So let's go ahead and walk through those anatomy objectives on your list. So in this video, I'm just going to focus on naming those different areas. So if we're looking at this model, we can see that we've got the brain here within the skull. This entire wrinkly part of the brain up here is called the cerebrum. The individual ridges or folds on the cerebrum are called a gyrus or plural would be gyri. So I would say that this is a gyrus and this is a gyrus and these are together gyri. The grooves between those ridges, each one of those is called a sulcus or sulci is plural. We can see here this structure is made of white matter and that is your corpus callosum and that is going to connect the two halves of the cerebrum. We call those two halves hemispheres so in this view I am looking at the right hemisphere of this person. Underneath that, in this area, would be the thalamus. And the thalamus looks like two halves of a clamshell held together at the hinge, which is right where that dot is. So you can kind of see an indentation here, and that's where cerebrospinal fluid is going to flow. You're also going to have cerebrospinal fluid up underneath that corpus callosum. The thalamus is kind of like an old-time telephone operator that is connecting incoming information to the different parts of the cerebrum. Right in front of the thalamus, this little area right here, will be a little easier to see on some other models, is right below the thalamus. So this is the hypothalamus. And this helps us with a lot of autonomic functions. And it also makes two hormones that we're going to learn about with endocrine system. The hypothalamus here is connected by a little stalk called the infundibulum to this large gland that we like to refer to as the master gland. That is the pituitary. The pituitary gland stores and releases these hormones 
and it also makes seven of its own hormones. Many of those hormones actually regulate the release of hormones from yet other structures, which is one of the reasons why it is called the master gland. Up in these spaces or ventricles, we see this kind of bluish structure here. This is a capillary bed called the choroid plexus, and it makes cerebral spinal fluid. Right behind the thalamus is a little gland there called the pineal gland and it makes a hormone called melatonin which helps to regulate your sleep-wake cycle. This part of the brain back here that kind of looks like a big piece of cauliflower, that is the cerebellum. And we're actually learning that it does a lot more than we used to think it did. It helps out the cerebrum with some of its functions, but its main function is going to be fine motor skills or learned motor activities. So think about walking, for example. When you were a young child, you had to work very hard and think very carefully about how to move your body in order to walk. As an adult, you just do it without thinking about it and that is thanks to your cerebellum. So people with very quick responses to motor skills that we don't want them to have to take the time to really consciously think about it up here are going to have a really well-developed cerebellum. So for example, musicians, athletes, pilots, surgeons, and we could go on and on with examples of individuals that need to have fine motor skills. This part of the brain right here, this is called the midbrain, and the midbrain helps us with eye and ear reflexes, as well as consciousness. And the midbrain plays an important role in helping the cerebellum make those motor skills nice and smooth. So Parkinson's is damage to the midbrain. So an individual with Parkinson's has difficulty smoothing those motor skills, so their movements are much more jerky. We also see a little channel running right through the middle of that midbrain. So the cerebral spinal fluid up here can flow into there. That little channel is called the cerebral aqueduct. And it is ultimately going to connect that fluid down to this space between the cerebellum and the brainstem. And this is my fourth ventricle. So the fluid started up under the corpus callosum in what we call the lateral ventricles, moves into this space here, which we call the third, through the aqueduct, and into the fourth. Don't worry, we'll go over that again in a few minutes. This part of the brain here is called the pons, and it helps to connect the brain stem to the cerebellum. And this bottom part of the brain right here may be the most important part of the brain. This is your medulla oblongata. And this is really the keep you alive part of your brain because it helps to regulate heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, um, vomiting, coughing, sneezing, and essentially things that keep you alive. If we look at the inferior view of the brain, there are a few things we can notice here. 
These structures back here, which are also over here, that is your cerebellum. Again, this entire kind of wrinkly part of the brain that's made up of gyri and sulci would be the cerebrum. That is also known as your thinking part of your brain. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Now what I really want to notice from this view are a couple of structures. First over here we can see the pituitary gland. It is not present over here on the cadaver, so it is missing. So the pituitary is right here. You can just see that infundibulum connecting it. You can see the cranial nerves really well from this view. There are 12 pairs of cranial nerves, but you only need to be able to identify two on a dissection or model. You've got this one here, which gets larger at the end and then kind of comes down here. And you can see it right here. This is the olfactory bulb, so it's going to bring you a sense of smell. And then this is the olfactory tract. So at the end of these bulbs, there will be little fibers that connect down into your nasal passages to bring you that sense of smell. So if we look here, right behind that olfactory nerve, we have a nerve coming in here, and then it crosses over to this side. We have a nerve coming in here, and it crosses over to this side. What you have are these nerves coming in from the eyes, and then crossing over. So the nerve that's coming from the eye right here and here. These are called optic nerves. Where they cross right there is the optic chiasm. And then where they continue down to eventually go to the occipital lobe would be the optic tract. Don't forget, on their way to the occipital lobe, they're going to have to pass through the thalamus, because that's our operator. Let's take a look at our superior view and lateral view of the brain and the skull. So we can only see the cerebrum from this view, but you can very nicely see the gyri or ridges and the indentations or sulci. Here's the anterior or front. Here is the posterior or back of the brain. So you'll notice then that I'm going to have my right hemisphere on this side and my left hemisphere on this side. Don't forget that your left side of your brain controls the right side of your body and the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body. We can divide the cerebrum into lobes. Up here would be my frontal lobes. Here would be my parietal lobes, and the frontal and parietal are separated by this groove right here, which is a little bit off on this left side. That is your central sulcus. And there's a specific gyrus right in front and right behind that central sulcus that we'll talk about in a little bit. You can see that central sulcus right here, separating frontal from parietal lobes. Way in the back is the occipital lobe, which is back here. And then you can just see part of the temporal lobe on the side. 
In general, the brain develops in this order, so it kind of goes back to front. And remember from the lecture video, temporal is for auditory and memories, or tunes. Occipital is for optics, or vision. Parietal is sensory, mostly. And frontal is everything else. So that's going to be problem solving, consequences, motor skills, and emotional control. Now let's take a look at a cadaver brain. And when we look at it within the skull, you can see that this doesn't really look anything like a brain. And the reason is this really kind of tough connective tissue that you're seeing right here, that is the dura mater. So that is that tough mother that is covering and protecting the brain. When I remove that, I can see my cerebrum underneath. So again, this is anterior. You can see sinuses or spaces up in the skull up here and then posteriors back here. So this would be my right hemisphere and this would be my left. There's a groove which is called the longitudinal fissure that runs right down the middle. You can see all these gyri and you can see the grooves which are the sulci. Let's take a look at this from a lateral view. We said that this is the frontal lobe. This is parietal. This is occipital. And then this would be temporal. This cauliflower looking thing back here that we talked about before is the cerebellum. And you can see the brain stem kind of underneath. And there's that pituitary gland. So here's my cerebellum. I can't see the pituitary from this view. You can see the central sulcus, and you can see a gyrus that kind of clearly goes up and down here, and one right behind it. So that precentral gyrus is part of the frontal lobe, so that's your primary motor center, and the postcentral gyrus is part of the parietal lobe. So that is your primary sensory center. Let's look a little bit closer. So here's my frontal lobe, parietal, occipital, temporal, central sulcus, precentral gyrus, which is my primary motor, postcentral gyrus, primary sensory center cerebellum. If we look at the cadaver and this model internally, again the gyri up here of the cerebrum, my thinking brain, you can see your olfactory bulb sticking out and those little fibers that I talked about before that go into your nasal passages. This right here and here is the corpus callosum. There's kind of a little layer of connective tissue that sticks down between the two halves, but this area in here and here would be the thalamus. So that's my relay. Right in front of that here and here would be the hypothalamus, makes a couple of hormones. Here's the infundibulum and the pituitary gland. That is missing over here. It should be roughly in this ballpark. Right behind the thalamus, which is pretty hard to see in this picture, probably right about there would be your pineal gland. Here's your cerebellum. And you'll notice that when you look at a mid-sagittal view, or medial view of the, the cerebellum, you can see this little branching white matter here. The branching white matter of the cerebellum gets its own special name called the arbor vitae, which literally means tree of life. Uh, the lateral ventricle will be up underneath this corpus callosum. My third ventricle is in this space, my cerebral aqueduct, and then the fourth ventricle is in this space here. The midbrain here has that aqueduct running through it. 
Here's my ponds and my medulla's right below. So here you can see the aqueduct. So this is my midbrain. And then they didn't cut this part in half, so it's a little difficult to see. The pons is the enlarged area here, and your medulla oblongata is right below it. Once you get below that point, now you're in the spinal cord. So let's take a little closer look again. So here's my cerebrum, my frontal lobe, parietal, occipital. You cannot see the temporal lobe from this view. This is my corpus callosum, my thalamus, my hypothalamus. Can't see the pituitary. Oh, there's my pituitary, actually, and the infundibulum. Lateral ventricle will be up under in that space. Third ventricle is in this space. So be careful when I'm asking you questions on the test to read the question carefully. Am I asking you to name a structure or a space? You can see that little channel running through right there. That's your aqueduct, the cerebral aqueduct. So that would be the midbrain. There's your pons, your medulla, and your spinal cord. This is the cerebellum. And you can see some of that white matter here. So this just gives you a closer view where you can really kind of see the pituitary, the infundibulum, the cerebral aqueduct. Pineal gland is a little hard to distinguish on this dissection, but it would be located right behind my thalamus. This just gives you a view from the opposite side. Be careful about always studying right or left and not thinking about it from the other side of the body. And these are all images that you can see on APR, the Anatomy and Physiology Revealed, or on the Practice Atlas on Connect. If I look at a transverse section through the brain, I'm going to get a view like this. And you can very clearly see the white matter in the middle here. And then you can see there's a darker layer around the outside. And that's where all the connections between neurons is happening. So all of this dark matter here is gray matter. And all of the gray matter of the cerebrum is called the cerebral cortex. And that is where all the important connections are happening. So on the model, they show it here as this kind of bluish color. And then here's my white matter on the inside, which are just myelinated axons. And here you can see part of the ventricles under each hemisphere so these would be your lateral ventricles, and they would join up with the third ventricle. If I look at a frontal section, here you can see those lateral ventricles here. You can see the gray matter on the outer layer, so that's my cerebral cortex. Um, you can see the cerebellum. You can see the white matter in the middle. If I look at the cervical nerves, I can see the cerebellum sticking out the back of the skull. You can see your spinal cord here, and then these are spinal nerves branching out. And you can see the occipital lobe of the cerebrum. So here's my spinal cord. These enlargements here are dorsal root ganglia. And then they connect to spinal nerves as they continue out. All right, we'll stop there and we'll do a different video for eyes and ears.